Hello, everybody. My name is Rihanna Dillon, and I am delighted to welcome you to BAFTA's hair and makeup design session. So joining me, we have Donald, Kerry, and Ivana. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for being here today, and congratulations on your nominations. Thank you. So Thank you. before we start, just tell us a little bit about your role, and what films you worked on. Oh, God, I always forget what I worked on. <laughs> I have no idea what I worked on. Uh, well, I'm a makeup and hair designer. Um, I worked with Kerry quite a few times, mm -hmm. and it's always great fun. Um, um, we worked together on Cold Mountain. We did the hours together. Um, and lots of other things. I can't remember what I did. And um, you're here today for the darkest hour. A few months and you choose today, to forget. <laughs> and, <laughs> exactly. And today for the darkest hour. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a hairdresser, um, and I've worked obviously with Ivana, and I've worked with Donald twice, and we did Blade Runner together, the most recent project together. Um, <laughs> what did I say? That's you. <laughs> That's me. And Donald. It's a bit like speed dating, isn't it? I know. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, obviously, Blade Runner with Carrie, we'd worked together years earlier mm -hmm. on... A really lovely Human film, Stain. The Human Stain, and Nicole Kidman and um, Anthony Hopkins, a long time ago. That was and, a long time ago. Uh, I've been around for a few years. <laughs> I've been a few. I love um, myself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, stronger uh, Nocturnal Animals last mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Some fabulous films. Thank you. Um, so I, what I really love is like backstage, all you guys, you all know each other and you love each other and you're so passionate about each other's work. Like, it's just really lovely to see. Yeah. Um, right, first of all, let's have a look at Blade Runner. Let's have a little clip and then you can talk us through your work. Okay. Welcome back, sir. You wanted to review the new model, sir, before shipment? An angel should never enter the kingdom of heaven without a gift. Can you at least pronounce a child is born? Hmm. A new model. See her then. Hi. Hello, hello, A boy. You alone? I have come blade runner. Put us all. Then that's a bit of bar. It's okay. Fine. Want to buy a lady a cigarette? Mm. Oh, you don't even smile. Didn't you hear your friends? Don't you know what I am? Yeah. Guy eating rice. What's that? It's a tree. Oh, never seen a tree before. It's pretty. It's dead. Now, who keeps a dead tree? Hmm. You're not going to kill me, are you? Depends. What's your model number? Why don't you look under my eye and find out? Oh, you don't like real girls. What a day. Hmm? You look lonely. I can fix that. You look like a good job. So, t 
talk me through the conversations that you were having with the director, with the other heads of department to create the design of these characters? D Donald, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, very collaborative, but really, um, I'd be lying to not say it was a challenge because we had very little time. Exactly. In pretty much everything. So we, uh, all out of kit. I mean, things with, with Ryan, we were, you know, none of us are really fortunate to do a film chronologically, but this one really was ass backwards. Absolutely, because <laughs> we had to start from the, you know, the very final scenes of the film, establishing Ryan and trying to imagine editorially and, and through the narrative what he would look like. Right. And it, it was, it always, you know, it doesn't always look complicated to people, but we who do it understand like that takes a second mm -hmm. and you get locked into something and you have one opportunity. And it's a one take and you've established something and, and that's it. But I think uh, the pink joy was a huge source of anxiety. anxiety. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> because everyone's idea of pink, you know, I finally, I think when I left LA, I went into the beauty supplier and just thought, oh my God, is it, the, the you know, we were getting sketches from concept from the director. Everyone's idea of pink, if you ask 10 people what is pink, <laughs> they will tell you, well, this is pink. Yeah, you've and got like this is pink. 20 different shades yes. just between. Yeah. And you know, I was lucky enough to have worked with Denis and Roger that I just would go to Roger and say, what the heck, like, what is it? We have no time. It was shooting two days later. Um, and I just, we were painting <laughs> swatches. And he said, bubble gum, just bubble gum pink. Obviously. <laughs> and, and you know, but you know, a Cuban girl with a you know not an ivory skin uh -huh. started pulling a little bit mauve a little, to a it. Pigment, yeah. yeah, and then it. But that's how we got to it, and then um, uh, trying to get the blood right so that there was a reflection and this blood looking a little bit pink. It's always a very Roger Deakins thing to have a reflection, uh -huh. and, and it worked really well and yeah, fantastic. Made us look good. And the question is, what color hair is going to go with the pink? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, was it is should it be on the lavender side? Not too pink, not too purple. You know, and sort of so we were testing basically shop bought wigs because you know that's the only availability we had because we're up against it. Mm -hmm. And that scene was filmed in pre-production, basically. Remember, mm -hmm. we sort of like four days into when Anna was there. That was our camera test. That was our camera test, was basically, <laughs> was that oh, look. Goodness. That was our camera so, test. We didn't have Absolutely. time to have anything made. It had to be hit the ground running, basically. Uh -huh. You know, and luckily I had some great people working with me that were great with color, and we were crazy color, but we wanted, didn't want it to look like a shop bought wig, obviously. Mm -hmm. And even though she's a character that uh, metamorphs into many different causes. Um, I still wanted to have a strong look, and I had this idea of this sort of sphinx-like character, sort of like, almost like a sort of predator sort of image, and yeah. that's where we come up with the hairdo and the color and the shape. And that reveal of Jared Leto's character, mm -hmm. presumably when it is a character like that, where they're in darkness and you're, you're sort of, mm -hmm. there's that tension, you're waiting for what he looks like, mm -hmm. is there a certain pressure on you guys to make it look snappy and for the audience to kind of pull back? I think I had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> I really mean it. Yeah, seriously. Um, <laughs> I, I did because, I, you know what Carrie's saying with the, the testing period, this is really typical now in filmmaking mm -hmm. where the, the pre-shoots and camera tests have really become I think we all feel it where it's suddenly, let's shoot this because it's, we're at this location. But we're still in our pre-production stage of fittings and hair and makeup, and people you know, will decide. And I was quite overwhelmed because we were you know, obviously shooting with Ryan every single day, prepping the girls as they came in, all the actors who were coming in for cameos. We didn't know who was playing Wallace. It was quite no, a guarded secret. Was... Really? Absolutely, oh, wow. and you didn't really have him till two, really two days before the shoot. He arrived on the weekend. We we're shooting on Monday. Oh my goodness! You know, so um, well, you know he was up against, and there was a, many different discussions of how he should look. We couldn't cut his hair because he was working on another production, mm -hmm. and so we had limitations of what we could do. Mm -hmm. You know, it was either ponytails or down. Yeah. Basically, yeah. <laughs> the, lens, the lenses <laughs> felt like. You know, the studio were concerned, and I have to say that 
a such wonderful production company because they looked at so many actors and it was availability. And that's kind of a newer thing now in our industry where actors are, don't you find where actors are on five other projects mm -hmm. and they're trying to squeeze something in but they can't change the hair, they can't shave. So I, I think my anxiety became when Alcon and Sony and Denis Villeneuve said, what are we gonna do with him? Mm -hmm. The contact lenses became a thing and I just got on to Stacy Sumner at uh, ProVision Care in LA where Jared was, but it wasn't so simple because he then wanted them based on a character of a man he knew. Mm -hmm. and Jared a, did. Mm -hmm. Okay, and just to make things a bit more complicated. Just, you know, just throw me a little curveball. <laughs> and we had just shot 15 hour days in Hungary. Los Angeles was nine hours behind. I'd get back to the hotel at 10 o'clock at night and then start that. And this would go on for a while but we were very lucky and that they hand painted and we piggybacked them, mm -hmm. two sets of lenses. There was one option to do a bald cap and I would say um, we did it. We did a quick test in LA through a shop that I like to work with and then again in Hungary and I hope they wouldn't go for it because it just started to look caricature mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and now that I look at it, I'm so relieved because Denis would never hire me again if I let him <laughs> do it is it started to look a little, um, a combo of sort of Austin Powers meets a James Bond film. <laughs> That's not what <laughs> And it wasn't the world we wanted. No. And it's brilliant, <laughs> other people who do it, but it would have not been good for this. Yeah. Um, and I'm, yeah, so that's, that was quite a source yeah. of anxiety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also having the actors at the last minute with hair-wise, the sort of thing, and Denis doesn't like wigs. But no. Mm -mm. Scripted, Anna changes into 11, different causes, so there's no other way around but wigs, <laughs> really. Yeah. Um, so, she, well, I had to go there, <laughs> basically, mm -hmm. and to sell it to him, in, he, and he, he went along with it, it was great, and, and uh, cut the character Mariette, which you just saw with the, the mm -hmm. sort of dirty beige pink hair, yeah. sort of, I wanted everything to look a little bit lifeless and a little bit colourless, almost like she'd picked up the wig out of a bin somewhere mm. and put it on her head, you know, so rather than it being an obvious sort of this is my look of the time sort of thing. So, and I sort of went, as a research thing, I went back, I went obviously a little bit 70s with it, sort of like rock chick, mm -hmm. sort of a little bit harder, but also I wanted to, for our main characters, take the, the colour out of their hair, almost make it look like it's sort of dank and mm -hmm. it's a dark, steamy, dead world sort of with no sort of sunshine and things, no life. So getting rid of all our blondes that were rocking up for screen tests was a <laughs> quick colour change. <laughs> do you have a preference between working with wigs and real hair, or do you think it's so basic I in character? I, I, I love wigs because you know what you're going to be getting every day, but I think it's a great challenge to work with someone's hair. I mean, in this one, we worked, basically most of the actors had their own hair, um, but in the situation, because of the humidity of the set and the steam machines and mm -hmm. everything else was there, it wasn't about structure of hair, it was about keeping it close to the head and also for the CGI, sort of when Anna goes into different characters and things like this, to be able to morph them in, I couldn't have big hair, small hair, up hair, down hair sort of thing, so it had to have a, a sense of, of closeness in head shapes so we could morph them backwards and forwards. Okay, well, speaking of wigs, let's have a look at Darkest Hour, and you can talk us through the design of that. Carrie's a wig genius, by okay. the way. Thank you. Miss Layton. Good morning. Follow me. That's need to know, and you don't. The lavatory? For the PM's use only. Uh. Sleeping quarters for when you miss the last train. Mom? That's the map room. No women allowed. What department's this? Indiscretion in conversation or any other form within or without these rooms regarding what happens here is a statutory offence, punishable by up to two years' imprisonment with hard labour. Clear? 
Crystal. Good. That's the war cabinet room. Never. I don't mean to be rough on you, but them's the rules. This is the typist school. Morning, sir. Ladies. Here's you. Fantastic. The very first day. Oh my goodness, they really did throw you in the deep end. Fantastic. Do you have something, it's like the complete opposite of Blade Runner because you have something very specific that you have to emulate. You have to be historically accurate. Um, so what kind of challenges does that throw up or is it actually better to be able to work from something? Well, funny enough, I love listening to Kerry and we work together a couple of times on uh, different projects. And um, what struck me uh, with uh, um, what you said about Blade Runner is very similar to uh, the process that you go through on a period movie like uh, Darkest Hour, because they're very character driven. Um, so an ordinary, so uh, modern day rom-com might not have the same mm -hmm. involved pr process that Blade Runner had uh, and The Darkest Hour has. So they're two very different films, but the process I think is very similar. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when you work with very visual directors, which we both have, they have a very clear idea or not a clear idea what they want um, uh, and what they don't want, and you have to provide that. So with The Darkest Hour, the challenge was um, that we were dealing with stuff, uh, with the material which is very well known to people, historical um, material that a lot of people know a lot about. Um, and that's always scary because I always think, you know, people will actually remember the people in question. Uh, the newspapers were full of, and in archives, and, you know, people remember uh, that time still. Um, and also we do remember those, a lot of people that we actually depict in this film. So you have to kind of honor that. So you have the great sense of responsibility to do it properly. So that was a bit of a challenge in this one. Um, apart from that, Joe Wright is um, incredibly, I mean, every time I work with him, I get nominated. So <laughs> <laughs> I have to thank you. He's your lucky charm. <laughs> well, because he's so visual mm -hmm. and he always has a great idea. And this one was difficult because of the, um, uh, you know, we literally we had to go through a list of characters and go, do people remember what um, Atley looked like? Mm -hmm. And he would go, of course, Ivana. And it was like, really? I don't remember what he looked like. <laughs> uh, so that's the kind of thing that you have to, or um, General Ironside, I was like, no one knows. I said, mm -hmm. no, they do. He was a very important figure. Everyone knows what, so mm -hmm. you have to kind of uh, do um, historical justice to some characters and then of course, What's great about what we do is you provide information that the script doesn't. So when characters appear on the screen, the director mm -hmm. quite often wants to you, the viewer to know what's going on in That's that right. person's life. Absolutely. So we have this great mm -hmm. responsibility to make people look um, ill or worried or scared or all those different things. Or fabulous. Or fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's the kind of the, so that's why the process is very similar. Uh, in research and application. Um, but yes, of course, this is, you know, of course, as well, it's 1940s, just the turn of, you know, 30, late 30s um, and 40s. And of course, that wasn't a very glamorous time in, uh, in, in history. So that's also quite important to make sure that people don't look um, too shiny and too new and too brilliant mm -hmm. because it was a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. Is there a moment where, you know, you're, you're doing the makeup and the hair for an actor and you can see them sort of them disappearing and their character emerging? Is that, that must be quite a special yeah. thing. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the best thing about what we do because mm -hmm. it literally, 
a lot of the actors that we work with um, uh, need that transformation to be able to play the character. Um, and they can't do it without. And that's why um, um, Kerry works with lots of wigs, because you need to change. If you don't change a person's hair and their eyebrows, mm -hmm. you don't change the character. So it's kind of, in a way, that's you start there, and mm -hmm. then you see them emerge, and then they can actually play different characters very easily. And also, they all, the actors like to take it all off at the end of the day and yeah, become sure. themselves <laughs> and go home, which is mm -hmm. also great to see. Yeah. To shed that character. And I, I like to know it's on a block somewhere. That we, can... <laughs> <laughs> that we have it safe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit more generally. Do you have a piece of kit that you just could not do without? I know you must have loads, but is there like one? <laughs> well, I do. I, I was very, I've been very fortunate to work with amazing people, but I started with um, Naomi Don and Jenny Sherko, who are both uh, BAFTA nominated and Oscar winners. and. Um, and I learned from basically when there was not much makeup. It didn't, you know, it wasn't very scientific at the time. It was mm -hmm. very quite primitive. Mm -hmm. And I learned, Jenny Sherker would always say, if you, uh, you can do the entire movie out of a crowd and grease mm -hmm. paint palette. Mm -hmm. And I still think today you can. Mm -hmm. I think that's I the agree. only kit you, you need. It's, it's a very primitive uh, color combination kit, but you can still to this mm -hmm, day, mm -hmm. you can even color yeah. hair with that, you can mm -hmm. do anything with it. And I think still to this day, with all the science, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. probably what we yeah. need the most. Um, I think we have uh, some images actually of Blade Runner, so we could get those up and then we could um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about. Okay, so look, here we have. I mean, it looks sort of fairly basic, but how These were just, just, these were kind of really quick. Remember, Carrie, these were sort of pre-tests. We'd get uh -huh. all the BG in. Um, we had a few minutes to sort of play, just so I could get Denis to sort of sign off on intensities. of, mm -hmm. And that way, on the day, is he's a very keen eye. I would say more so Roger on the background, mm -hmm. and which I think are really Great important. Faces, yeah. um, so the Trash Mesa, um, so really all our groups of background uh, visually would make a statement. And I, we'd just get them in for a day, and this Amazing. would be the original reference, right, obviously. Okay. And then elements, mm -hmm. I think, uh, thereafter, and we just grab. You tease out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, fabulous. That's the iconic way. Just in the wig. Yeah. And the contacts. It's and the contacts, which you know, were, were a fear for me because you know actors always say, "Oh, it's fine. It's really comfortable." Fit in Los Angeles by Whitney and Dr. Sumner, and the day of they hurt, and you know that's. Uh, uh, but we had a phenomenal lens tech in Hungary. I have to say it was the best I've ever worked with in my life. Oh, wow. Yes, and she could really she was um, diffuse. Yeah. yeah, because that was tricky. Mm -hmm. um, right, let's turn it over to the audience then. Do any of you guys have any questions for our panel? Yes, there's a microphone just coming to you. Um, another question for Ivana. You said that um, there were a lot of uh, characters where you had to be very uh, aware of how people perceive them because everyone remembers what they look like. Were there any, was there sort of a level at which you stopped doing that? So were there any sort of mid-level generals or whatever who you, who you didn't do that with because you, you stopped doing that, basically? Um, well, that's a really brilliant question because there is lots of different reasons and factors why you would consider that. And one of them is the budget of every film. And the other one is the time factor. And then simply the practicality of letting the actors be able to do their job properly. So we are literally, at one point, I said to Joe Wright, the director and the producers, like, what, what point, what cast number do we stop insisting uh, uh, that we try and make the, um, uh, the, the characters look like the, the real people? Mm. And we decided that it's not necessarily kind of, it doesn't go from 1 to 15. It was literally, um, uh, we chose the characters um, um, and the actors to help the actors do their job properly. So there were certain characters that we paid great attention to. That they're not in the film very much, but you, it was really important to get them to look period and to look like the person so that it would help them to become that um, character better. So it was, a right, it was a mixture of, you know, certain characters were in it only for a day or two and we spent a lot of time on. Um, but yes, I mean, mainly I would, you know, I did my research um, 
uh, through all the you know archival footage and stuff, and, and literally some of the characters, some of the some of the some of the politicians I really never heard of, but they were in the cabinet, and you think, well, actually, we should pay attention to those. Uh, but it was really to help the actors uh, uh, perform. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more quick question. Um, yeah, there's a gentleman just here on the third row. general question how do you maintain a um a work-life balance because you touched on it a little bit um, <laughs> what life um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you want to start that never happens you know it's i'm really I, it's a great question and i don't know the answer other than for people starting out, if I could do it all over again, and I've done it for 32 years, 33, um, which means I started when I was five. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, was gonna say, I, right. I would honestly say because life changes and things happen, and I love the work. I think we all do. Anybody here loves the work and the artistry. And, but you know, it, there's a big sacrifice, which I certainly wasn't aware of. And they don't teach you that when you're coming up. I wish I'd learned a little bit more balance um, of looking after one's health and eating properly. And it's very difficult. And it's not an excuse because people will say, well, that's just lame. But no matter where you go to work in the world, I mean, to work 16, you know, my last, job, I'm still on the film, we're doing 80 hours a week. It is a bit, once you get to a certain age, you think, this is, who's doing that? Do you know? And I actually had a friend who's a resident at Cedar sinai who said to me, you guys do residence hours, except you do it for 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> they do it until they qualify. You can only do it when, if you love it. That's basically yeah. Yeah. The, the, otherwise you won't be able to sustain all of that. But also now with, the, with amazing opportunities in television, things have got worse because now exactly. you get these mm -hmm. incredible projects with great directors who pull you into things which are seven months long. Um, and you're doing, suddenly find yourself mm -hmm. doing, um, working with five directors who shoot on the same project at the same time. Um, and you're doing 10 hours of television, which is amazing content. And you have to invent how to do it. You have to actually not just be a makeup and hair designer. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to in help the producers how to organize a department, which never used to happen. We used to no. be told when to turn up and what to we do. do it now. now we have to tell them yeah. because we become experts in what we do, which is great fun. But after seven months, you suddenly go, that's no work life <laughs> balance. <laughs> I, I do think working. just to add to what Ivana is saying, that I think it's now the time for the very senior people in the industry or people who are maybe at the tail end of a career to really educate and uh, start getting makeup, makeup and hair designers. We have to take this back. We have to become very responsible as associations, as guilds, uh, academies to start. In the makeup industry, hair has changed. The, what we're expected to do, you know, as Ivana said, where we used to, you know, turn up. You know, but now, I, I mean, I started on films that were zero budget films in Canada for the National Film Board of Canada for, it was me plus one, you mm -hmm. know? And now we're on films where I have 30, in Hungary, 30 additionals. Who manages that? I mean, mm -hmm. we need to start working broader scale like other departments. And I, I do think politically, it's the makeup and hair have got to step up now um, so we can stay working and do our craft and stay healthy. Yeah. I think that's a great piece of advice to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for coming as well. Thank you.